You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than do fish ever get thirsty, that question would have to be, Mark, what are the specific characteristics of three mystery films and how can you use those to your benefit for street photography in Ballarat and Melbourne? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. The final video in my Victorian odyssey, the return journey from the Grampians to Melbourne via Ballarat, I'd grappled with coastal cliffs, mountains and waterfalls, and had stared deep into my own soul. Not liking what I saw, it was now time to return to some kind of normality, coddled by civilization, and shooting random rolls of film as I wandered the urban streets. But which rolls of film? What specific film stocks would best render the scenes before me? Well, before you get too excited for the educational part of the video, you might want to lower your expectations. There's no method to this madness, or even madness to the method. I simply take to the streets with random rolls. Ipso facto, the learning comes later. Post facto, if you will. And de facto, as an alternative to any interesting photographs, you get to hear me talk ad nauseum, ad infinitum, and ad hoc about grain, contrast and colour as I push and pull film and Latin phrases to breaking point. Starting on a dreary grey day in Ballarat, an old gold mining town that once rivalled Melbourne in size and influence but is now a place where you give street directions in reference... First shot was of a plain wall, just trying to get myself warmed up.
So did you guess the film? Tell you what, I'll give you a clue. It's black and white. Okay, a second clue. You'll notice that not every photo is sharp. The conditions weren't friendly to my old manual zoom lens with a tiny aperture. After a couple of shots, I soon reverted to my Voigtlander 40mm f2, which definitely added some challenges to the composition. At least that's my excuse for failing to be inspired initially by the wonder of Australia's fourth largest inland city, which is tantamount to Flight of the Concords claim to being New Zealand's fourth most popular guitar-based digibongo a cappella rap funk comedy folk duo. I've got good feelings. I've got Look, Ballarat is a place of significance. They even have a Chatham house here. Not sure if it's the UK think tank or just some place owned by a guy called Chatham, but many is the meeting I've attended where we have observed Chatham house rules. A little more benign than the rules of Fight Club. It was my first visit to Chatham House, but nobody made me strip off my shirt and engage in visceral violent debate about the fraught macroeconomic conditions resulting from geopolitical instability. Also, in deference to Chatham House rules, I will not name and shame the town for my failure to produce any interesting images so far. There are no crappy towns, just crappy photographers. And to prove that particular rule, I loaded Roll 2, Switch back to the versatility of my zoom and continued to shoot. I love a reflection and these couple of photos reflect the construction work opposite as effectively as they do my photographic inadequacies. There was only one place to go from here and that's down. Down to the lobby to check out of the hotel anyway and capture these final photos to be a souvenir of the place that boasts the greatest concentration of statues of any Australian city. The inflatable monkey might not perhaps beat the Burke and Wills Memorial Fountain or the Titanic bandstand for history, but they never actually made it to their destination or died on their way back. Mr. Monkey was doing well and looking far more aerobicized than he was yesterday. But we had to leave because we had booked into prison. So, like Ballarat's own Steve Monaghetti world record holder for the over 60s 5,000 meters, we made a speedy departure. Ignore the fact that it's now part of a hotel complex. Pentridge Prison was a name that struck fear into the hearts of the most hardened criminals since its inception in 1851 to its closure in the 90s following a spate of riots and murders. Conveniently located just five minutes away from the Pasco Vale Doss House that is my daughter's share accommodation, it seemed a more salubrious place for a family visit. Now open to tourists, we were too cheap to pay for access to the notorious cell block H instead, opting for the trauma light option of the general grounds and main building. I had with me my Voigtlander 20mm f3.5 SL2 lens, a gem that no doubt I'll do a proper review of sometime, and a necessary one to discreetly take in the gravitas of the place's history. As I mentioned, this is now a hotel and one of the original cell blocks is attached to the lobby so you can now fully appreciate the failings of the Australian criminal justice system as you sip on your banana daiquiri in the hotel bar.
Each cell plays recordings of inmates and prison officers' time in the prison, including the obviously deplorable privations they experienced, such as the challenge of being able to source proper pornography. You can see that one of the inmates left his cell in this state, probably only one step up from the conditions my daughter was experiencing in a shared house. The central exercise area was designed as a panopticon, consisting of circular segments with a central tower allowing the watchman to see all of the prisoners without being observed himself. Invented by reformer Jeremy Bentham during the Industrial Revolution, obviously neither Big Brother nor Google had been invented at that point. All that remains now is a recently unearthed foundations and some blanked out graffiti. Since they knew they were being constantly watched, I suspect this originally entreated their captors to like, comment and subscribe and to ring that notification bell to receive updates when another episode of Cell Block H is uploaded. Like many before me, I tied some sheets together and armed with a makeshift dagger fashioned from an old plastic spoon, made my escape into the city. So any guesses about this film? Not the smooth creamy tones of exhibit one here. Gobs of grain and yes, those observant among you may have noticed it's another roll of black and white, which was fine since it suited the miserable Melbourne weather and the grim subject matter of Pentridge Prison. The final roll should be an easy one since it's color. And how many color films are actually left anymore? One hint, it's not Kodak Aerochrome.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the center of Melbourne at about seven o'clock. Sun has just risen, and we're off exploring on a Saturday morning. Oh, and we're doing it with a Nikon FE and my favorite Voigtlander 40mm F2. If we need that much light, I'm using. So have we learned anything? No. Have I made you sit through my holiday photographs using deceptive clickbait 
Well, really, you're the one who decided to watch a video comparing three unnamed films in the first place, so that one's on you. And now, shall I do the big reveal? First up, Ballarat Light Stalking, and that was with Ilford FP4+, a film that struggled with the conditions. Seriously, rating it at 125 is like when they take five cents off the dollar value of something to make you feel like you've got a good deal. Whichever way you look at it, it's not a low light film. Although uh, the gorgeous tonality of FP4 is there, as well as the moderately low grain, at least when properly exposed. This was developed in LC29 and I love how it managed to give plenty of detail in these shots. It managed to keep those creamy tones too. One of the things that makes FP4 a little bit boring is its general flatness. Hard to describe, but FP4 often just looks like shades of grey. Whereas my favourite film, Fuji Across 100, can give things almost an inky and silvery look. Still, it did a good job on things like the metal pipe in this picture. I think part of it is the micro contrast on this Voigtlander Ultron 40mm lens. Yes, I know it sounds like an Avengers movie, but this low element count lens definitely has that fabled 3D pop. Less effective here though. Even though it was afternoon, it was a dingy day and the alleyway was even darker, so despite the low light capabilities of the lens, it struggled at times. Certainly a big difference between the first and second film, with the second film being Ilford HP5. I know, it's like having a mystery meal that turns out to be pie and chips. Yes, boring old Ilford HP5, but with a twist, pushed to 1600, developed in microphone stock solution. I may have been in Pentridge Prison, but ISO 1600 was liberating. It allowed me to use the 20mm lens inside to capture those bleak jail cell interiors. Not that it's perfect. HP5 loves to cling to shadow detail, and you occasionally see flecks in the dark areas when pushed to this extreme. I don't think, personally, black black looks very pictorial. So I tend to lift the darkest parts of the image to very dark grey and then just crush the shadows when pushed this much to try and give a wash of darkness. This is probably the most egregious example. Nothing left in the highlights and shadows, but I guess it's an image that relies on symmetry and form rather than detail. Obviously, you get more contrast and grain when you push film. That's just physics, and I'll be honest, when I first scan in negatives that I push, I always recoil in horror when I see them at 100%. But we don't look at photos normally with our face pressed up against the screen, and when I compare it to FP4, well, it's definitely worse on both accounts, but the pictures do have character, and I think microphone definitely takes the edge off. I've developed pushed HP5 in Rodinal before and it's not a pretty sight. Here Microfin did the film proud and it allowed me to capture the grit and darkness of the Melbourne streets without too much compromise. But of course you're probably watching this on your phone and YouTube is a forgiving spouse, hiding my photographic flaws the way that a beaten wife says it's not his fault, he's just having a difficult time at work. Still. Black and white isn't the way the world is, unless your world is a Zack Snyder director's cut. Colours where the action is, and the third and final film turned out to be Lomography Colour Negative 800, which really is a mystery meat. I've shot with it several times and I still don't know what the hell it is. I think as the day progressed, I will have overexposed some of those images. The Nikon FE is an aperture priority camera um, and it's easy to find yourself shooting faster than a thousandth of a second if you're shooting wide open and move into the sunshine. So what's the history of Lomo 800? Some say it's Kodak Max 800, the kind of stuff they put into disposable cameras. Others say it's some sort of uncoated Kodak motion picture stock. I've mainly shot it in 120 format, so I don't think it's some re-spooled film stock, although is that halation I see in the highlights? Am I actually dealing with some Cinestill wannabe? Regardless, it's a great punchy film with surprisingly low grain and good dynamic range. I processed with Cinestill CS41 and edited in my usual high key fashion, and while the shadows do get a bit muddy and magenta, it's held up here okay. I've recently been shooting some of the 400 speed color Lomography film in 120 format, and it has similar qualities too. 
I'm loving the stuff, but other than that one teaser, those results will have to wait for another day. Regardless what it lacks in the understated Kodak portrait stakes, Lamography seems to make up for in the slap in your face colors and contrast without the ugly skin tones of Kodak Ektar. Here are probably a few of my favorites from this role at least. So sure, I can acknowledge it's Kodak, but I can't somehow believe it's motion picture film, even without the Remjet layer. I've shot some 800T, and this is obviously a daylight film rather than a tungsten one, and it doesn't have the muted, tasteful palette of most of the Vision 3 films I've tried. You tell me in the comments below. Okay, so not the most scientific experiment, but a good way to try out a few different kinds of film and experience the varying conditions of Ballarat, Pentridge, and Melbourne City. So tell me, have you used any of these films? Have you had similar results? What do you do? develop with, any hints or suggestions about how to make the most of these three film stocks. And perhaps most importantly, tell me your thoughts about Lomo 800. If it was cheaper, I can imagine it being my go-to film, but since color film is generally so expensive, I'll probably put it on the bottom shelf of the fridge and bring it out for one of those rare and precious occasions where color is appropriate to capture the moment, like when I'm feeling happy. Later.